So uh, hello everyone and welcome to the CER webinar on the UK's new integrated review of security, defense, development and foreign policy. Uh, my name is Sophia, I work for the CER Berlin office. Uh, the UK government has published this review a week ago. It's a document that sets out to define the UK's role in the world post Brexit really and to provide substance to the slogan of, of Global Britain. And the review has come after decisions to boost defense spending and cut development aid. And it has since been followed by a defense command paper, um, which has announced a significant reduction of the armed forces. It's a 114 pages, wide ranging whole of government strategy that wants to bring together all the instruments in Britain's foreign policy toolbox, including departments that would not previously have been considered part of the national security community, as it says. And now that we have all had some time to read it, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Koi Shake and Lord Peter Ricketts as our panelists today, who will help us think through the implications of the review for Britain and for its allies as well. Dr. Koi Shake, of course, is the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and also a CEO board member. Uh, and Lord Peter Ricketts is a former national security advisor and former ambassador to France. We have an hour today, as I said, so Peter and Corey are going to kick us off with short interventions before we go into a discussion. And let me just say before we begin that the event is on the record and we are recording it. Um, Peter, you, I just learned uh, recently, have a book coming out this year about your experience with the big choices that loom behind the integrated review. Would you like to just maybe set the scene for us? What are your main takeaways from the review so far? Peter, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sophia. And it's great to see Corey back in London, even if beaming in from Washington. Uh, fantastic to have you, Corey. We, we miss you here. Um, yes, so here is the long awaited, much hyped British integrated review. Uh, it's full of interesting ideas. Uh, I think John Bew, the main author, and his team did very well to write up um, a readable review and to pull the ideas into some kind of coherence. They didn't entirely hold the line against um, Johnsonian hyperbole. There is an awful lot about Britain being world leading on almost every page, but you can sense that the uh, team uh, kept some grip of the narrative, kept it under control. For me, one weakness of this review is that it doesn't make any effort to set priorities. Uh, in 2010 and in 2015, we did publish a prioritized list of national security risks. Probably wasn't perfect, but it did provide some guide to resource allocation. I think this review, I hope Corey won't mind me saying, goes more in the direction of a US national security strategy, i.e. a long laundry list of worthy, noble ideas, um, but leaving the choices to be made later uh, as life sort of plays out. Now, looking at the foreign policy side, I thought the review described global trends rather well, um, systemic competition being the theme there. A lot of the advanced spin here was about the tilt to the Indo-Pacific. But when you look at the document, actually, the emphasis is all on European security, on NATO, on the alliance with the US, all of which, of course, is very welcome. And actually, the passage on the Indo-Pacific seems to me to be quite measured. Uh, it's a shift that was happening anyway towards more diplomatic economic engagement with this fast growing part of the world. And uh, in this review, some more military presence as well. It won't possibly make up for the trade that we've lost by leaving the EU, but I think it makes sense in geopolitical terms. Um, I also thought the passage on China, which was much awaited in the review, um, is very carefully balanced, uh, weighing the fact that China is now a strategic competitor with us, with the um, other unavoidable fact that China will remain a commercial partner of the UK. I thought it put the cursor about in the right place, but it will be interesting to see whether that can be sustained against the um, pressure from um, China hawks in, in the Tory party and uh, the views from Washington. The heart of the strategic review is this um, framework, strategic framework, which is the more innovative part of it, I think. And to me, it amounts to big bets on two points. 
first big bet that the UK's prowess in science and technology can be turned into a driver for both strategic and economic advantage. Of course, this surfs on the success that the UK has had with vaccine development. It also plays into the narrative about greater supply chain resilience in the high-tech area uh, against the threat from China and to the green growth agenda. It proposes a very interventionist government approach towards boosting R&D, attracting talent from around the world. Question, I think, is, is that goal realistic? The UK's track record, I think, has been very strong on invention, but much less strong on pulling that through into commercial success. And the review is notably silent on the financial sector and the city, which is a real motor for the British economy. That was also a Cinderella in the Brexit process. Uh, it feels to me like in number 10, scientists are strongly up, but bankers are still flat on the floor. The second bet in this strategic framework is regulatory diplomacy. I think it's an important concept. And the review sees the UK as playing a leading role in shaping the norms, the standards, regulations in the new technologies like um, digital services, cyber, uh, data protection. Of course, the UK has had a long and very honourable role in norm setting. If you think of the laws of war or the International Criminal Court, um, we have been at the centre very often. I think the problem with both of these propositions is that the government are finding it currently impossible to say anything positive about a relationship with the EU. Uh, there's only one sentence I can find in the report on the EU about the EU's role in peace and prosperity in Europe. But I would question whether we can credibly claim to be the leading European security power, a world force in science and technology, and in regulatory norm setting if we don't have a functioning relationship with the EU, which is going to remain a very influential player in these areas. I can understand it's too soon to expect a government document right now to get our perspective, uh, perspective on our relationship with the EU, but I do think it leaves a gaping hole at the heart of this review. Another ambition is soft power, uh, a soft power superpower, and the review quite rightly lists all sorts of areas where Britain is um, powerful, has real influence around the world with its soft power. My problem here is the government's actions rather than what it says in the review. I think that they've been undercutting the impact of Britain's soft power, getting rid of DFID, cutting the aid budget significantly, threatening to break international law over Brexit, leaving the Erasmus program of student exchange, not securing working visas for our cultural sector to work in Europe. All of these things are opening up a gap between the words and the actions. Last point, sorry for going on too long, defence. Here I'm very interested in what Corrie makes of the review. Even before it was finished, of course, as you said, Sophia, the big choice had been made in the large boost to British defence spending as well as the cut in the aid budget. Even if that 24 billion uplift over four years only closes the gap in the programme, it does give the MOD a real chance to reshape its strategy uh, for the next decade. The headlines were grabbed by the uh, increase in the nuclear warhead ceiling. We can talk about that if people are interested. Um, but I'm still left unclear by this defence white paper exactly what the choices are uh, in the defence programme. The aim is for a military which is busier, which is more visible, which has more of a navy out on the high seas, which has the new ranger battalions uh, working with other less advanced nations on training and assistance on the ground, I think with the idea that they would do the fighting if that was necessary. All that seems reasonable. The big bet is on the army, and again, it's around technology. Uh, the bet is that technology can substitute for mass and for manpower numbers, and that future confrontations will be um, often in the grey area below conflict. Um, and if there is to be fighting, then the UK's role should be uh, niche with small high-tech forces and therefore presumably other allies providing the mass until the UK could mobilise reserves. My question is whether the British Armed Forces can emulate, for example, Israel in a high-tech army 
um, capable of making the most of the technology that's coming forward. And how quickly can they do that? It's quite striking in the Defence White Paper, there are very few numbers. And I wonder whether the retiring legacy platforms happens more quickly and it's going to take longer for the new high-tech army to be formed. Some questions there. Obviously, no review can provide all the answers. And this one sets a lot of goals, has a lot of interesting ideas, many of them admirable. Uh, but I think the real choices are still to be made. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Corey uh, Shaki, you are the author of, as Peter just called it earlier, the Bible on UK-US relations. How did the review land in Washington? How was it perceived and, and what stood out to you? Yeah, so let me, do, let me reverse the order of those, Sophia, to start by talking about the review on its own terms and then talk about how it's being received in Washington. I have to tell you, my friends, I am so homesick for the earnest disappointment of British culture, the way you guys always think you're rubbish at everything and don't understand that all the rest of us are actually worse than you are. This is a terrific review. I was full of envy that it did such a better job than my own government does. I mean, American strategy is almost always just resourcing, not actual strategy. And, and serious American analysts despair every time our government talks about whole of government operations, because that just means we're not actually going to do anything useful. Whereas this review, both in the run up to it and in the review itself, did actually position the British government really well given its strengths, its vulnerabilities, and the nature of the international order. Right? The fact that the government raised defense spending, folded assistance back into foreign policy, as though you know, the notion that they should be unrelated it has always been kind of mysterious to me. My own government can't find a way to reintegrate the two. Um, and set a, what looks to me like, um, finally, finally, an explanation of what global Britain is going to look like. Britain is a global power and it, it has global interests. It needs to be a global power. And this review takes a serious uh, swing at what that will actually be. Um, the, the fact that they positioned the structural decisions about the British government, the spending top lines, the organization in advance of the strategy gives the strategy more heft. Um, I thought especially good as Peter did, the discussion about China. And, and here, again, British policy is delivering in advance of the strategy itself. This looks to me like an important refutation of the disgraceful George Osborne tack of trying to make an opening to China make up for what would be lost in Europe uh, after Brexit and takes a very serious look at the challenge China poses in terms of our values, in terms of our economies, in terms of our security, and positions Britain to be a major force. And again, I agree with Peter, I think the regulatory power um, is really consequential. Uh, I agree with Peter about the two big bets, but I also am more supportive of those big bets, I think, than at least Peter sounded in this conversation, because I worry about a Britain that has too little ambition, not too much. And the two big bets are the right ones for Britain's prosperity and Britain's security, the comparative advantages that Britain brings in those areas, I think are the right place to slam your foot down on the gas pedal, because if Britain doesn't succeed in those areas, it actually won't succeed in other areas. They're leading indicators of broader success. I also support the decision in the, um, in the integrated review and its follow-on in defense review to, for Britain to be 
a land power in Europe and a maritime power in Asia. Um, I share Peter's concern about the reduction of mass, but um, I don't mean to be unkind, but the British Army doesn't have adequate mass now. So it can't actually do a lot of the things that people complaining about cuts to the army are asserting that Britain can do now. And so I think accelerating forward into a smaller, higher tech force is a reasonable choice um, for the British military. And if managing a rising China is the major concern, uh, about which the British, uh, the integrated review seesaws a little bit on Russia versus China as major threats. It, I read it as banking on the, the NATO alliance and the good work of partners to be able to maintain a positive correlation of forces against Russian aggression in Europe. But I absolutely agree with Peter. The needless antagonism of Britain's European allies, both in the course of Brexit and since, is going to make that harder to pull off. And it seems to me that, um, that one of the questions the integrated review raises for me is whether others will permit Britain to play the role Britain outlines here for itself. Um, and not just in Europe, although the needless antagonism of Europeans is the sharpest point on that, but also it looks to me like Britain's bet on the Indo-Pacific uh, will mean they will very quickly want to be a member of the Quad, for example. And it's not just questionable whether the United States will permit that, but whether India will permit that or Australia will want to uh, feel overshone by Britain in that role. So, uh, so the actual contributions are really going to matter. To Peter's point about the absence of the city, I think that's really true. And, and it's a failure that American strategy makes too. Our success, especially with respect to China, is going to require more than whole of government coordination. It's going to mean dragging our investment communities and our high tech communities into a similar threat perception that our governments and our national security communities have. And at least in the United States, we're failing wholesale on both of those at the moment. Um, so uh, I'll close by saying I love the idea of Britain as a soft power superpower. Um, but soft power doesn't negate the need for hard power and the sustainability of the strategy. Um, Britain has a lot of advantages for the sustainability, but it doesn't have some of the advantages it had in the 19th century. And to a little bit, this strategy sounds to me like Britain in the Napoleonic Wars right, that we're going to orchestrate other people's forces. And we have uh, commercial dominance, but Britain actually doesn't have the world's reserve currency anymore. It's not clear why other countries would be willing to permit Britain uh, to orchestrate their forces, especially if Britain doesn't bring heft to the table. So I ardently hope it succeeds. Uh, I believe it will succeed, but in the implementation of it, and I'd love to talk more about the defense review in the q and I think there are some real questions about sustainability. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Two really interesting perspectives, I think. We now have time for a discussion. If you have a question or a comment, you can use the raised hand function, or you can tell me in the chat, and my colleague Jordan will then prompt you to unmute yourself. But I also ask you to please introduce yourself. Uh, I will start with the, with the first question while you think of yours uh, on the nuclear issue because uh, Peter, you raised this already. So one of the most surprising announcements has been the decision to revise the planned cap on the nuclear arsenal from 
I think no more than 180 to no more than 260. And in the review itself, there isn't much of an explanation given for this decision. Ben Wallace has since said that the UK lifted the nuclear cap to have enough to defeat improved Russian ballistic missile defense. <clears throat> So my question really is for both of you, uh, perhaps Peter, how do you interpret, how do you contextualize this decision? And then Corey, uh, the US administration in its interim national security guidance says that it wants to take steps to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in national security itself. How would you say does the US see the UK's decision to increase nuclear warheads? Perhaps first Peter. Thank okay, you. let me take a first shot at that. Um, first of all, I'm, I think we should take the government largely at their words on this. I don't think there's any secret agenda here. They feel that uh, the minimum credible deterrence numbers have gone up. Um, they're still aiming for a minimal credible deterrence, but given technological developments um, and threat developments that they think that they need uh, a greater margin of numbers. I think by the technological uh, and the threat, they mean um, proliferation, obviously, nuclear weapons and missiles particularly the aggressive Russian missile program, um, uh, which has been much vaunted by uh, Putin, improving Russian BMD, ballistic missile defenses, yes, that too, and the development by Russia of um, intermediate range missiles um, for the first time since the INF Treaty. I think all of that has sent the British back to the maths of deterrence. We're not used to thinking about the maths of deterrence, but now that state-based threats are back, I think they have to do that. And their conclusion clearly is that if you're going to have a deterrent with all the expense of that, it needs to be credible and therefore it needs a greater margin of warhead numbers, potentially maybe one day having to put two boats out rather than one uh, and the warheads to go with that. And so they're not necessarily, I think, going to increase to that figure, but they want the margin to do that and to maintain a bit more ambiguity as to exactly what they're deploying. So I absolutely agree with Peter. Uh, you know, what's driving the change in the British position is the changed Russian threat um, and the changing technology that may one day make uh, oceans more transparent and therefore submarine-based nuclear forces targetable. And so I thought it was a sensible judgment. I thought they were uh, straightforward about the making of it. We have too little discussion in our free societies about the role of nuclear deterrence in our security. And I thought it was quite admirable how they addressed this. Um, in the United States, I think there was um, appreciation at the sober serious mindedness with which Britain looked at its nuclear requirements and understood that, uh, to take your point about the, the US uh, interim strategy, right? The non-nuclear countries who are NPT signatories are exasperated with the P5 for the fact that we haven't actually made more progress towards denuclearization, which, some, which is something all of us committed to. And the US interim review is just empty rhetoric more empty rhetoric about what we will do while all of us are grappling with an international order in which we would like to diminish the role of nuclear weapons, but our adversaries have no intention of so doing. And just to give the most egregious example, NATO unilaterally at the end of the Cold War reduced its nuclear arsenal to 200 warheads um, and Russia, diminished its non-strategic nuclear forces by zero warheads. So we took a 90% cut, our adversaries took a 0% cut, and that's what's driving the kind of recalibration. Okay, we have a whole lot of uh, hands going up and questions in the chat as well, which is great, uh, but I might start grouping them already. So uh, let's perhaps hear from David Haney and Stephen Green first. David Tanny, please. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you very much. I think, Corey, you were slightly um, over generous to us, but uh, don't let's complain about that. Uh, let's hope everyone else will be over generous to us too. Uh, they'll need to be. 
But um, let me just say one or two points and ask you again to go back to the nuclear thing, which I don't quite understand why both of you are so sure it's the right thing to do. Uh, but one or two observations. I was a bit struck by the Indo-Pacific tilt. The, unless I skipped it in the hundred pages, they never told us what the Indo-Pacific was geographically. But they didn't say where it was, where it began and where it ended. Uh, does it begin it, it, does it, or end in Latin America? I don't know. But it's very odd to say that you've got a whole new strategy and you don't say what it applies to. And I do have to observe historically that the last time we sent capital ships to the Indo-Pacific, they were called the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, and we all know where they ended up. Uh, they were, of course, not very well protected either. Um, so, and regulatory, regulatory diplomacy. I'm sure that's right to have identified that as crucial, but we have, of course, uh, thrown away the main means we had of influencing regulatory diplomacy, which was as a member of the European Union. And how useful, effective we'll be at regulatory diplomacy outside the European Union, I think is pretty, pretty disputable. The EU will be effective regulatory diplomacy. The US will be too, probably some others like China, but the UK, I don't know. So I'm sure they're right in their perception, but I'm not sure they've, <laughs> I think they've thrown away the only, the best means of achieving it. Could I ask you on the nuclear? Um, a little bit slightly not what you covered. The doctrine that was propounded of deliberate ambiguity about the scale of uh, your nuclear uh, arsenal and what you might use it to do, who you might use it against. Is that really a very good idea? If uh, the UK, if, sorry, if the US, uh, Russia, China, uh, France, uh, India, Pakistan, Israel, all practice deliberate ambiguity, are we going to be in a safer place? I rather doubt it. So could you just, and also tell us why it is that having more British warheads, which I think <coughs> most people have assumed over the years, we would never use separately from NATO effectively. The chances of a circumstance arising in which we had to use our national, uh, our national deterrent, particularly against the Russians, were extraordinarily unlikely. They posit, after all, the United States that has deserted its NATO allies. Uh, so if that's the case, why are you so, feel so pleased that we have more of them when we're never gonna use them separately. Great, and then we'll have another question from Stephen Green, please. Thank you, am I, am I unmuted? Um, good. Um, you are, Stephen. Uh, but, but Peter, good, good afternoon. Um, can I ask a question uh, um, which is, and Peter will know this, coming from the mouth of a lay person in this, um, um, so I, I read my newspapers and uh, there was a time, Peter, when I was a little closer to this when I was in government, but, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, two, two, two separate questions. One on nuclear, just to reinforce what David Haney has already put on the table. Uh, I am struck by the fact that the proposal to increase the warheads has produced all but no public comment and indeed the whole question of whether we should be a new uh, a nuclear power in this day and age in the 21st century seems not really to be a subject of public discussion in this country and yet I think I'm right in saying that the nuclear capability is something like 20 or 25 percent of our total defense spending. Um, now, I, correct me if I'm wrong on that but my understanding yeah. is it's quite high. Um, so uh, it, it just surprises me that, uh, that given that it's hard to imagine it ever being used, I share David's uh, scepticism that we would ever actually use it and its cost, um, why do we not merely, uh, 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 why is there not more debate about not merely the increase proposed, but, 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 but the fact that we've got it at all? Um, and then a second, if I may, related observation stroke question 
well, sorry, it's not a related one, um, is about vaccines. Because I think the, 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 the fracas about vaccines at the moment is pointing to an issue about self-sufficiency, um, which is going to become more <laughs> acute in a more geopolitically tense world. Um, it's as if we are going to revisit the continental system of the early 19th century. Uh, you know, we've been there before and what we've learned, we the Brits, is that you can't disengage yourself from Europe, however much you, ha however much you try. And we're about, I think, to find this all over again, over vaccines, where what was, until the last few days, trumpeted as a British success story is going to get more complicated than that where we because we're going to end up having to share vaccine um, capability and possibly slow down our own vaccine program that's uh, it, it's, it's a sensitive example currently of course but it's it, it, it relates to some wider issues TSMC is absolutely critical to the world's um, chip industry TSMC sits in Taiwan um, and becomes the focus of geopolitical tensions for obvious reasons. So I, I'm really just looking for your your kind of reactions to those to the thought that self-sufficiency and supply chains become a bigger and bigger issue in the world ahead of us. And then secondly, to this question about whether you really need a nuclear weapon capability at all. Thank you. Hey, Corey, would you like to start us off this time? Yeah, so I think both of the questioners are actually uh, questioning the fundamental commitment to nuclear deterrence. You know, if you want so much to emphasize that you would never ever use your nuclear weapons, you're actually diminishing the deterrent value of their uh, of your reliance on them in your arsenal, and that may be the point, but I would uh, suggest that a Britain that persuades itself its ultimate, the ultimate guarantee of its sovereignty and security uh, is no longer necessary, is making a really big bet in an international order that feels increasingly dangerous and where the countries that are making it increasingly dangerous would very much like Britain to be irrelevant to the security calculations that they make. Yes, uh, I mean, can I pick up from that? I think there isn't a lot of public discussion, partly because the issue of whether we have the nuclear deterrent or not is, is really not on the table, um, in the sense that we took a decision you know, a decade ago now to replace the nuclear submarines. That program is underway, they're being built. Um, and uh, I don't think that anybody really thought this review was going to be the occasion to re-debate that. Um, it's one thing if you don't have nuclear deterrent to think, should we have it in the current world? Britain is in the position where we have had it for 60 years. And the question would be, do we decide in this state of affairs that we no longer want to have a nuclear deterrent? Um, and I don't think that that is, a, you know, is an issue on the table at the moment. To go back to David Hannay, I don't think there is a, a doctrinal change here. I don't think our doctrine has changed about um, you know, circumstances in which nuclear weapons would be used. I think the uh, review sets out a pretty classic position on that. I think the arrival on the scene of new intermediate range nuclear um, armed Russian missiles is a new factor. Um, and why number increase? Well, um, I think, as Corey said, the threat has changed. Britain is well below the numbers the French have. This takes us back towards the sort of numbers that the French have. Um, and at the end of the day, if you're going to have a deterrent, it, it needs to be a credible deterrent. And Stephen, no, I don't think the, uh, the nuclear program is anything like 25% of the uh, defence budget. It can get quite large of the equipment budget when the... Um, new submarines are being built, but, but I think it's uh, steady state cost is a lot less than that. Just on vaccine self-sufficiency, I mean, yes, of course, vaccine issues are very tense at the moment. The rich countries are squabbling among themselves on uh, who's going to have the biggest share of the available vaccines right now. Um, of course, resilience um, and who manufactures becomes an issue. But surely the real issue is even if the rich countries do manage to vaccinate all their people, we still won't be safe if the rest of the world isn't vaccinated. 
because we found that the vaccine covers borders, especially you know, uh, even when borders are closed. So um, this is not really just about vaccine self-sufficiency in the West. It's about mounting uh, a massive operation to make sure that the world is vaccinated. I think we're only right at the beginning of that. And that's where the UK and the EU ought to be cooperating, not squabbling. Great. Uh, we have I'm sorry, I should have picked up David Hannay's <clears throat> point about Britain as a regulatory power. Please go because ahead. I actually think Britain's <clears throat> superpower is from relatively weak institutional positions, organizing others, persuading others that what Britain wants is also in their interests. Uh, what I notice as an American policymaker is that the difference between British diplomacy and everybody else's is that Britain's good at persuading the United States that what's good for Britain is also good for us and getting our power harnessed to their interests. So I don't think you should despair of your ability uh, to be able to, I don't know, join TPP, join NAFTA and team up with the Canadians and Mexicans to impose regulatory standards on the United States. Uh, lots of ways Britain's great at this. <coughs> we have quite a few more questions to get to, so if I could ask everybody to keep their questions as short as possible. Uh, we'll go to Jeremy Greenstock and Ian Bond uh, next. Jeremy asked in the chat, uh, the review raises the question of UK credibility. Can you think of early actions that might begin to restore that credibility? Yeah. And then Ian, if you yeah. want to ask your question as well. Thanks very much. And thanks very much to Peter and Corey. I, I mean, two quick questions. One is um, about the question of outs outsourcing our security to our European partners in Europe. Um, I mean, a while ago, the UK was one of those that, that was least enthusiastic about sort of role specialization. Um, and in a way, the logic of, of this and of the cuts in the army is that we've gone rather more in the direction of saying, well, you know, let the Germans provide the tanks and we'll do something different. And perhaps a, a related question. I mean, I was really struck by what Corey said about um, the, the UK acting as a land power in Europe and a maritime power in Asia. I and mean, isn't the problem with this review and with the, the Defence <laughs> Command paper um, that actually what we're trying to do is to ignore the fact that we've got a lot of sea around us in Europe, um, make a sort of a maritime bet in, in the Indo-Pacific, however defined, while simultaneously reducing our land contribution in, in Europe. And hasn't that been sort of reflected in what people like Mike Mullins and Leon Panetta have been saying about their, their worries about um, how overstretched the UK would be? <laughs> Corey, do you want to respond to that directly? And then we'll go to Peter. Sure. Uh, if you think there's a lot of water around Britain in Europe, uh, wait till you see the span of the Pacific, even before you fold in the Indian Ocean. I mean, the Pacific is a maritime theater. Uh, and so I think it was smart of Britain with its limited forces to focus the maritime piece of its strategy or of its contribution in Asia. And I do think in the European context, nothing was going to substitute for Britain having boots on the ground on continental Europe. And so to suggest the fungibility of maritime power, it, if I had been Polish or German and the strategy had taken uh, the uh, Britain as a European maritime power, what it would have told me is that Britain really was writing off Europe. And I do think the land commitment, in particular, the uh, <coughs> undertaking both in the integrated review and its defense applications to put British ground forces in a much more, <coughs> excuse me, technology forward, innovative, and lethal capacity is the right move. Okay, um, well, the, just to complete on that and then come back to Jeremy's question about credibility. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable 
to think that in modern warfare, if it does ever get above gray area into conflict, uh, things will move very rapidly. Uh, and the UK is never going to have enormous forces deployed forward on the continent of Europe. It can have some of these new agile forces, but we're going to have to partner with those who are there, the Germans, the Poles and others, if something happens in the eastern part of Europe. But the other thing I would just underline is that at the moment, I think we're making two bets on the army. One is that they can do that. They can get lethal, agile, high tech. The other is the persistent engagement point where we'll have ranger type battalions there to train and mentor and assist and uh, stiffen the backbones of, uh, of allies farther, further away. Those are two rather different roles. Uh, and I'm sure the British Army is capable of doing it. But uh, I think we have to understand that there are two quite distinct kind of uses of the army being planned there, and they'll need to be resourced as well. Just on Jeremy, what can the UK do to re-establish its credibility? I mean, I would say very quickly, uh, keep our word. When we give our word, keep it. Uh, keep the exceptionalist rhetoric under control. Uh, put in the work in the international system to make a difference, to be a good ally with ideas, convening power, as Corey says, and make it work. And for heaven's sake, work out a relationship with the European Union for the future. We can't limp on too long with this um, uh, completely, um, uh, you know, a, a gaping hole where there should be a functional relationship with the EU that needs both sides to get over what's happened in recent months uh, and make things work. You saw me nodding there. We'll have questions from Francois Esbourg and Michael McClay next. Francois. Mm -hmm. Okay. I unmuted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a, a very brief point before I get to the question. Uh, it's an integrated review. It really is an integrated review. And this is the first time I've ever seen an integrated review. So if only for that, uh, the Brits really deserve, deserve credit. I mean, in the same way that they brought into uh, the policy planning picture 20 years ago, the notion that you had to plan for national security and not only for defense, that was the Brits. Uh, so uh, although I deplore the, over, the abuse of the words uh, cutting edge in the integrated <laughs> review, uh, the integrated review actually is cutting edge. Uh, uh, question, uh, if one were to use uh, a paradigm where you would have a <laughs> risk sharing priority on the one hand and a burden sharing priority on the other one. Uh, the integrated review seems to me, at least on the face of it, to choose a risk sharing strategy. Pretty much like the French actually, with the Indo-Pacific tilt and the symbolic but actual presence of military forces put at risk in the Indo-Pacific region, however you define it, uh, alongside, uh, uh, although not in overt alliance uh, with the United States of America. And I'd be interested in having particular Peter's uh, a, a view on this. I mean, is, is my reading correct? Because if it is correct, then there is, I think, a bit of a problem because if anything, uh, on the defense part of the integrated review, uh, the Navy doesn't really seem to be getting uh, the sort of kit that it would need if one takes the tilt particularly seriously. It's a fairly lopsided force. Two carriers, that's great. But when you look at other surface combatants, uh, it, there isn't very much out there. And even the French now have more. And that is not in our tradition. Uh, so I'd, I'd really be interested in having reactions there. Just two very quick points, if I may. One is on nukes. Uh, a, I agree with the British rationale. Uh, B, uh, they wouldn't have hurt themselves if they had simply said, we will remain of the, of the five countries which are recognized nuclear powers, the one which will continue to have the smallest arsenal. Uh, and therefore we, we are doing nothing bad vis-a-vis -vis arms control commitments. That could possibly have helped defuse uh, some of the reactions, uh, notably in Germany, 
and Heiko Maas uh, found it necessary and urgent to speak up against uh, the British uh, decision on this, which I found rather, rather, rather odd. And the last point is, don't join the Quad. Uh, we should have a tier of Quad Plus members. That is, have the Brits, have the French come in to a second circle of the Quad, and that would also allow you to actually resolve the South Korean issue, because the Quad as it stands is not going to be open to the South Koreans. I don't think the Japanese will let that happen. Uh, but you can bring in the South Koreans if you bring in the Brits and the French in a second in a second circle of the Quad. That's my little suggestion for the day. Very interesting, Francois, thank you. We've had a related question from John Mayer in the chat, so I'll just read that now. Mm -hmm. With limited hard power, what can the UK actually hope to achieve in the Asia Pacific region, particularly from a military point of view? And then we'll go to Michael McClay next. Michael, please. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, I'd like to ask Corey first, and welcome back, Corey, um, how the review has been seen in Washington, apart from the good chips that you've given it, uh, a bit on how far the B Biden administration uh, sort of sees through the superpower <coughs> stuff and does see the integration uh, that you do. Uh, and specifically, if there was one area that Britain had some claim to being a superpower in recent times, it was international development assistance. And how far the talk of integration actually compensates for the really dramatic cuts from 0.7 to 0.5% of GDP, which are really undermining so many of our frontline uh, development programs. And I'd very, be very interested in how far Peter sees this as a bit of a, a gap in the review. <laughs> Okay, perhaps we'll start with Peter's answer to Francois's question and the development question, and then we'll go to Corey for a reception in Washington. Peter, please. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Francois, and uh, good to hear you. Um, I guess the problem could be that the UK sees itself as risk sharing, whereas many of our allies will be interested in what burden sharing offer we are making, because the two are relevant. Um, in terms of um, risk sharing in the Indo-Pacific, uh, I agree. I don't think the Royal Navy has got the kit um, to sustain a major presence there um, over the long term. Uh, it's going to be episodic. It's going to be um, visits by carrier task forces occasionally. Um, but then I think you shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that the Indo-Pacific is becoming the kind of center of gravity of UK national security policy. You might have thought that from some of the advanced hype for this integrated review. It's not really what the review says. Uh, indeed, it, it does say you know, that a leading, the leading player in European security is the sort of heart of the, of the British uh, defence role. So uh, I, think, I think it's accepted in London, really, that we can never be more than a secondary player in Asian security issues. Um, useful, yes. Um, it's right we should be there. But I don't think it's going to become, you know, the major driver for the Royal Navy. It's a very useful um, way for the government to explain why we have two aircraft carriers, of course, and that I guess we have to expect. Um, and so I think rather rather the same um, on on the point from the chat. I mean, what can the UK do militarily in the Indo-Pacific? Well, it can um, show presence, um, uh, show solidarity with other Asian allies by occasional presence, but it's not going to move the dial significantly, I think, on its own. Um, and uh, I'll leave it there, I'll, I'll let Cory take on the second point. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, on what the British military can achieve in the Indo-Pacific, um, I take Francois's criticism, I too would like to see a 400 ship British Navy. Um, <laughs> and yet, uh, what Britain is contributing will be anchors of broader cooperative multilateral forces, right? Singapore really wants to see a British aircraft carrier in the Pacific. Uh, Australia wants to see it. The other countries are gonna contribute uh, the ships that fill out the <laughs> flotilla. And that has the overwhelming advantage of reminding a China that is increasingly repressive at home and aggressive internationally, that this isn't a US-China challenge. This is 
a China attempting to tear down a rules-based order that uh, European countries in particular want to see preserved and may even have the influence to drag the United States inside the respect for. Uh, moreover, uh, Britain has taken an incredibly brave foreign policy stand on Hong Kong. And if you don't have military power operating in the region, it will be harder for to gain the advantage of brave foreign policies without being underwritten by being a military force in the region. And that I think is an important uh, integrated effect that the British military operating in the Indo-Pacific achieves. On development assistance, <clears throat> Michael McClay's excellent question. Uh, you know, um, the Biden administration is arguing that its foreign policy is going to be driven by what's good for the American middle class. And the uh, average American denizen of the middle class loves the American military and thinks we spend 3% of GDP on foreign assistance. Now that's an education problem for the United States, but it's also a problem because the American public feels like our assistance policy is disconnected from protecting and advancing our interests in the world. And that's what I think um, reconnecting, the value of reconnecting it for Britain. And um, the, as to the size of the aid budget, um, I actually, it looks to me like they made that sacrifice in order to free up the resources to increase defense spending. Um, and I think that was a responsible choice given the nature of change in the international order. Okay, uh, I want to go to Charles Grant and Francis Burwell next, but I'll start by reading a question from Edward Burke from the chat. <laughs> Um, and he asks both speakers, how much appetite do you detect in Paris to pragmatically insulate bilateral French-UK defense cooperation, sort of rebooting Lancaster House post-Brexit? So that's uh, the question on France. And then Charles Grant, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Sophia. Mine follows on from that last question. Um, <clears throat> we, haven't, we haven't talked about the French idea of strategic autonomy, which the review, the integrated review, of course, says very little about. It says very little about Europe at all. But I wonder if, if uh, given that, as, as Peter and Corey have said, it's harmful not to be able to influence, it's, it's a problem for the UK not to be able to influence what's going on in European defence policy if it has a bad relationship with its European partners. Should we be worried about the French concerns to achieve strategic autonomy for the EU or, or Europe? Um, is, I mean, they, they argue that if, you, if Europe does more for itself, that's good for the transatlantic relationship, it becomes more capable. Others, though, worry that it may deter the, Euro the Americans from staying committed to European security. I mean, the, my, perhaps my question really is, should we encourage the French to include Britain in making it Europe's strategic autonomy rather than a more narrow EU strategic autonomy? Is, is, and should we, should we try and take part in it? Is it, or is it a, a dangerous concept? Okay, and then Francis Burwell, please. Sorry, I'm having problems. Okay, it took three times to get on YouTube. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so my question kind of follows on that because I was uh, not, I was a bit <laughs> concerned that we have not seen much focus in not only this paper, but the European, uh, the UK debate about the EU. And so my first question is about um, what, if anything, can the United States do to, bring Britain and the EU back uh, on the same page, so to speak. Um, it's a little bit like risking trying to repair the damage between two divorcing friends. I re recognize that, but I'm wondering if there are things that the US should do or should we just stay out? And then um, for Peter Ricketts, I wish you would say more about the role or the emphasis on rule of law as something that uh, boost Britain's credibility? And how does it fit for, I mean, Britain has long been known as a supporter of rule of law, but there are exceptions. 
And one currently underway is the Mauritian claim on sovereignty on the Chagos Archipelago and Diego Garcia, which has been uh, recognized in an advisory opinion by the ICJ. The UK hasn't really engaged. Does that kind of thing um, lessen the UK's credibility on rule of law, or is it just one of those instances that you know all big countries have to deal with? Okay, some great questions at the end there. This is our final round. I'm sorry if I didn't get uh, to your questions as well. Corey, would you like to start with closing statements really in responses to these questions? Uh, sure. First, on what should the US be doing to repair uh, Britain and the EU? Uh, I'm skeptical we are adroit enough to navigate this uh, in any way other than giving both Europe and Britain somebody else to be mad at. Uh, so I probably wouldn't push that just now, other than showing that they cooperate on other things. I mean, I think the sanctions against China for human rights depredations that all of us engaged in, the way all of our diplomats showed up at the trial of the Canadian hostages uh, last week. You know, there's lots of practical cooperation that just continuing to do, I think would be useful and for the US to continue to foster, uh, but I wouldn't make it a major objective. Uh, what was the other question, Sophia? There's one more question from, from Ian actually about the reception in, uh, in Washington. Um, and then a question on France. Ah, uh, yeah, the question on strategic autonomy. So Charles Grant, you and I back in our youth published an article in Survival on how to make strategic autonomy work to the advantage of the transatlantic relationship. And I despair that I don't feel like anything else needs to be said. You know, the my entire professional life, Europeans have been talking about this subject and not producing a ton of forward momentum. I think the United States was initially really concerned about it, but I think that time had, that ship has sailed. Uh, France is right. The more Europe does, the more the United States will appreciate European partners. It would be graceful if the EU could find a way to do it in partnership with the US rather than in contrast to the US. Shall I pick up the ball? Okay. Um, well, thanks very much everyone for a great discussion. Um, just quickly on those last points as well. Um, do I think there is an appetite in Paris to insulate um, the defense relationship from the wider tensions on the EU? Um, yes, I do. And I think there is in London as well. Uh, Francois Eisbourg and others can, can you know, would confirm that with more credibility. Um, but can it be done? Um, I personally think that if the scratchiness and tension gets to a certain point, you can't escape some blowback on the bilateral defense relationship, but perhaps particularly in the defense industrial relationship, I think the operational cooperation between the armed forces will continue. I, I think that is in everyone's interest. But, you know, I sense uh, already a real loss of momentum in that Lancaster House uh, programme of defence cooperation um, since um, the UK left the EU and, and all the difficulties have begun. I, mean, I don't see much élan in the current programme. I don't see any new ideas. We're still working through the ideas we had at Lancaster House. And indeed, we've lost the idea of a Franco-British um, future combat air system uh, that's now being pursued, unfortunately, by two different um, consortia in Europe, again, with competing models. So it can't be kept totally insulated, in my view. Um, on strategic autonomy, um, I think Corey is right. Obviously, if strategic autonomy leads to greater European capacity um, in uh, defence, but also you know, wider resilience of Western countries, that's a good thing. My question has always been around the French idea on strategic autonomy, autonomy against who? And I think it has too often in the past been autonomy against Washington, um, and it risks looking inward uh, and even becoming a protectionist model. 
Should we take part in it? Asks Charles. I don't think that's on the cards at the moment. I think that's an integral part of being a member of the EU, and we've checked out from that. So uh, by all means, we should continue to try and shape it around the edges, but I don't think that uh, there is much we can do. Is there much the Americans can do to help heal the rift between the UK and the EU? Not much in the short term. Try to stop it getting worse um, by making things worse over Northern Ireland, for example, uh, might be a role that Joe Biden can play. Um, but this is going to take time. Uh, it'll take time for the political temperature to drop. And there will be a moment where the Americans can, I'm sure, play a, a kind of conciliating role there. And very lastly, on the rule of law, yes, it is a theme of the review. It's a theme of the current British Foreign Secretary. Um, it's been important in policy towards China. I think it is weakened mainly when the UK themselves seem to play fast and loose with international law, as they've uh, done once over the Northern Ireland Protocol and now seem to be doing again. I think that is the real problem. I think the Chagos Islanders are a really difficult problem. <laughs> It's a kind of problem that major countries have to deal with around the world. I don't think that in itself undercuts our reputation for respecting the rule of law, but I think how the government behaves domestically could do. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you so much. I want to close on time, but thank you so much for your time and your insights, uh, Corey and Peter. I really enjoyed this. Thank you also for the great discussion and the great questions and comments in the audience. Um, We'll see you at the next CIA webinar. Goodbye. Thank you. Come back to London soon, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my friend.